incident was about to take place that would shake the foundations of the civilized world. It is time to open your mind. Time to discover your divine self as we navigate this holographic matrix together. Strap in, Cosmic Family, as we slide through this wormhole of cosmic information together in search of, search of, search of, search of, search of the truth. The truth. You can't handle the truth. It's time to go inside the matrix. Inside the matrix. With your host, Jimmy Brent. All right, welcome everybody to Inside the Matrix. I'm your host, Jimmy Brent. <laughs> And I uh, hope you're having a wonderful day or evening, depending on where you are uh, in the world. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, hope you're having a great time. Uh, my guest today is Noel J. Hadley. He's an independent journalist, longtime writer, and the recent author of Worthless Mysteries, Flat Earth, The Divine Council, and The Search for the Immortal Soul. The bulk of his research focuses primarily on the ancient mystery religions stemming from ancient Babylon classical philosophers, and the disastrous consequences of Greek Hellenization. Noel's current book is called The Unexpected Cosmology. In this book, he weaves a story about many of today's most notable flat earth researchers and presenters, as well as his own story. Noel's writing style is witty and engages the reader to think as well as read. Noel, welcome to Inside the Matrix. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, got you. All right, we're on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you here, Noel. Um, I think we'll just start out normally, as we usually do, uh, with asking you, kind of give us your background. Where are you from? Where were you raised? Um, what was your education or indoctrination? <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and thank you so much for having me on your show. I've been looking forward to this. I we had some technical issues before this, but like we, I'm excited, <laughs> excited to be on. So um, let's see. You know, th that's an excellent question because in in the truther uh, movements, the the flat earth movements, all these different uh, truther movements, we all come from different backgrounds and uh, kind of have different worldviews. And I was raised in the uh, Christian church. Uh, I, I kind of identify with Rob Skiba a lot. He would always say that whenever he grew up Baptist, just like I did, and he would say that whenever the church doors were open, he was, he was inside. Um, I grew up um, as a PK. That's an acronym for uh, pastor's kid, so watch out. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, so I, from the earliest um, – from the earliest stages of my life, I was taught um, a, a, a slogan of the reformers, uh, uh, a sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. So from when I was a very young boy, when I would you know, go to my father with questions about evolution or other things like that, he would say, well, what does scripture have to say about it? So we would take it to the Bible and we would, we would look at it. So that's, I was raised a lot in the Young Earth Creationist Movement or like guys like Dr. Henry Morris in San Diego. Um, and I talk about that in my book as well and, and, and other things. So yeah, that's kind of where I came from. Okay. And you were in the United States then? Um, yeah, born in Long Beach, California, uh, raised in Hawthorne, California. That's the home of the beach boys. I met my wife in high school back in the nineties in Long Beach, California. And, uh, we were just little kids then. she was 16. I was, I mean, I was 16, she was 15. And uh, in 2015, after being married for, I don't know, I have to do the math, I think it's 13, 14 years by this point, we had twin boys, they were a year old. We'd, we were so jaded and were so sick of life in Southern California that we sold everything. We got rid of our house, we got rid of all of our stuff, and we moved into an RV. Um, actually, technically, it was a fifth wheel, but some people know what a fifth wheel is. A lot of people don't. Sure. So for those of you who don't know what a fifth wheel is, it's an RV. And yeah, I used to for those of you who know what a fifth wheel is. Okay. And so we just started hauling it across the country. And we started driving across the United States. Um, didn't really know where we were going to end up. This is 2015. And after several months of driving, about seven months of driving across the country, we pulled up to Charleston, South Carolina. And we loved it so much. We bought a house there. That's our new adopted home. But we still travel all the time. We just got back from spending our year in Europe. So 
Um, we were living we were living in France and then the United uh, the UK uh, for most of the year. So, um, that, and now my present whereabouts. I'm calling you from Florida. All right. Well, that's great. You know, uh, everybody who has come into flat Earth uh, seems to have a, a you know a different story about it. Some people, like myself, uh, as soon as I was introduced to it and I began to look into it, I had no problem with it whatsoever. And after months and months of you know researching it and looking at it, it, it was inevitable to me that that was exactly uh, what we're living on. But a lot of other people, it's a very volatile issue for some reason. Some people are are just just get absolutely livid when you question that whole idea of, you know, where we live. Uh, what is the cosmology of the universe? You know, how did, no. how did things come about? And, and uh, I'd like to hear, you know, how you came into that. Oh, excellent. And when did you come into it? Were you... Uh, uh, 2015. You know, 2015, okay. Now, I, the only reason I did not come to, into it in 2015 was because... Um, I had kind of heard this thing, Flat Earth, but I would, like, go to YouTube and, and uh, you know, like, the Flat Earthists would show up in YouTube on, like, the, the, the comment section. But they would never talk about Flat Earth. They would talk about things like space is fake or satellites are fake. And I'd be like, what are you guys talking about? Like, it just, there was, like, it would, there was nothing, like, there was no, nothing practical about that. I wasn't sure. I, I didn't really know what their point was. And um, so I first – I've always been fascinated – uh, with the concept of of a flat Earth, partly that's due because I love history. Um, you know, uh, like Greek Hellenization is an expertise of mine that I write on a lot. But I used to really be, be into like the Middle Ages, and you know, we've been fed a lot of lies about what they believed and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But um, and so it was probably around 2004 when uh, Daniel Shinton, uh, who, who you know uh, is probably you know. Whoever this guy really is, just throw that out there. We don't really know, but he started the. He took over the Flat Earth Society from uh, from uh, Samuel Shinton and Charles Johnson and and the Brits and others. And I had heard about this, and so I was really interested. Like, wow, there's someone out there. So this is 2004. I was um, I was turning 24 that year, and I was really fascinated by this concept that he, someone somewhere out in the world someone thought the earth was flat i never thought they were stupid i was just really interested what what do they why do they come to these conclusions so i actually visited and, and he didn't really have a website back then it was like a like a forum you know with like those like rectangular blocks and such and i would like read in on their conversations uh daniel and some of these other guys uh -huh. and nothing really made sense to me it, it seemed very esoteric it was just very um it, it, there was nothing really I don't know. There was definitely, definitely a guy like me, a solo scripture guy. There was nothing about the Bible or scripture or anything like that. And so I kind of walked away from that going like, I don't really understand any, what, what they were talking about and, and so on. So um, it was finally came down in uh, 2016 when uh, I was on YouTube again. And this guy approached me and there was like all this energy, uh, like everyone was a buzz. It's like all oh, the flat earthers have arrived. So I approached this guy and I asked him a question. And the first thing he tells me, he says, you're going to hell. And I said, well, why, why, <laughs> why am I going to hell? And he said, because you don't believe the earth is flat. And he actually said that. And, and, wow, and you know, my immediate, my immediate response could have been, um, you know, well, this just proves, you know, you guys are just, you don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. Um, but as soon as he started talking about how it's in, in, in the Bible and in, in Hebrew scripture, that it, that immediately got my attention. Like, wait a second. So I started just looking up on my own and I came across, there was no, like, um, there was no YouTube videos I watched, nothing like that. It was just, um, I came across this 19th century pen and ink sketch. Um, everyone's probably seen it. It's a very primitive looking sketch of Hebrew cosmology where it shows right. like the, the firmament and the, the great deep and the pillars and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the entrance way to heaven above. And this is something that I've been really trying to understand my entire life. I would, these are the kind of conversations I would have with people 20, 30 years ago, where we'd be sitting around going, what's the firmament? What does that mean? And the great deep. And like, we just couldn't visualize this. We tried right. really hard to understand, like, what, what does this all mean? And 
And immediately when I saw that, that thing just sparkled with animation and it just came to life. And I was like, oh my God, like that's exactly what the Bible is talking about. Like it just, all the, that's the whole thing from beginning, it just came together. And so I was, you know, I was hooked at that very moment. And as this is early 2016, and as everybody knows who's come into this, when you first start researching it, you become obsessed. And it's just like, you know, eat, sleep, poop, flat earth, right? It's just, it's just <laughs> constant for like four days. That's um, true. And so my wife got home from work and I made her dinner and we're sitting down in our house in Charleston. And she's like, so uh, looks like you've been researching something today. Why don't you tell me about it? And I was like, okay, just, just, you know, you know, hold on Strap to your butt, in. you know, there's, 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 there's this, there's this, <laughs> there's this, <laughs> there's this theory out there, you know, these people, you know, talking about the earth being flat. So I take her through scripture and just, and, and at the end of like 20 minutes, she looks at me and she's like, yeah, that sounds about right. And I'm like, no, no, it doesn't sound right at all. Like we're not in, but she was, so she was on board and keep in mind, she's like worked with like satellites and all this stuff. She's worked with a lot of uh, government contracts in the past. And she's like, yeah, I, that was the first question I asked her. But what about satellites? She's like, yeah, they can take that, you know. So, um, and f since that point, I've been, uh, you know, on this journey. Now, I want to get back to you had mentioned uh, how some people are very hostile to this, and I, I, I had told you that I grew up in a household sola scriptura, uh, you know, very reformer based. Um, you know, if, if we don't we don't use it, doesn't really know what that means. It's we're not supposed to use any natural revelation to uh, to trump uh, scriptural revelation. So, um, if if something you know, if if the heliocentric model is proposed by science and and the Bible doesn't say that, then we're not to go by the heliocentric model, right? So, and I had mentioned that before with evolution. So, I was a closeted flat earther for about a year. And I really didn't want to come out about it. I, I wasn't really – I had no problem processing it in my own life, but I really didn't know how I should – if I should come out publicly about it and that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> finally, I went and decided I was going to tell my dad about it before I came out. So I – because I I've, this is the kind of thing. I would have these discussions with my father, a pastor, for years about anything in the Bible. Everything was open. And I flew across the country. I went – living room and i and i and i said i said when i when he sat down with me i said dad you know i've been reading this stuff in in the bible recently that moses would write about like you know the firmament and you know the the creation account isn't describe a heliocentric model and i you know i start describing the great deep and the pillars and all stuff and and he just stopped me he's like whoa, whoa, whoa i'm gonna stop you right there and he started describing it better than I could at that time. I mean, he's just going through all the scripture. I didn't, I couldn't, I was fumbling around. He was just laying the stuff out. And I said, I was like, I was shocked. And I said, dad, why, why didn't you ever tell me this before? Why didn't you ever tell me this is what they, what it said? And he said, I'm going to go into the other room. I'm going to pull out my physics textbook. I'm going to come back in here and prove you wrong. He got up, he left the room. He never came back. And it was in that moment, right? That has never happened to me in my entire life. It was in that <laughs> moment right there where I just shot, sat there shocked, going, wow, the power of this thing. Like this is, this is powerful on a very spiritual level. And, the, you know, the indoctrination runs so deep. So right. um, that was kind of my coming into story. Um, so I started um, blogging uh, Flat Earth, and this was by this point early 2017, and I – I really didn't know what I could really contribute to the movement because people were already, you know, talking about all sorts of stuff out there. And so I just started, you know, blogging scripture. And within about three, two to three months, I was then contacted from a person who then was employed by Sacred Word Publishing. I don't know if you know Sacred Word Publishing, if you know Zen Garcia. Um, yeah, this was that. Zen Garcia's. Okay, well, this is Zen Garcia's publishing company, Sacred Work, and they contacted me and said, "Hey, we really like your writing. Do you want to, um, do you want to write a book?" And I said, "No." <laughs> I told him, "No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be involved." I actually turned them down. I said, "Well," he said, "Well, you can come on our radio show." I said, "No, I don't want to do that." So um, we were traveling across the country, 
So we were up in Canada. I was staying on the Green. We were living on the Green uh, Gables estate, uh, where the the story Anne of Green Gables actually took place, up in um, uh, Nova Scotia. Mm. And I'm sorry, Prince Edward Island. We were in Prince Edward Island at the Green Gables estate. And I finally decided. I called them up. I said, you know what? I'll I'll write the book for you. So that's how I kind of came into the the movement. Um, I was invited by Robbie Davidson, who was putting on the Flat Earth International Conference, uh, to go to the first conference. Um, and the, the idea was, is I was going to write this book and uh, publish it in time to premiere it there. I had very low internet, so I had to go off all my notes. It was a very chaotic writing schedule, and you know the rest is history. So, um, and you know now I'm obviously I'm chronicling the movement itself, and I'm really excited to have guys like. Uh, Bob Nodal and Rick Hummer and Rob Skiba and Robbie Davidson and all these guys, you know, call me up on the phone and they're, you know, trusting me with all these details and I'm cataloging it and, you know, writing it down for them in these books. So uh, I'm just excited to really, you know, find my voice now in this movement. That's great. And uh, so did your dad say anything more to you about it? No. And I, I want to be real careful because, you know, I, I want to really let the viewers know that I, I really want to honor my parents um, and I'm not trying to dishonor him in any way. It, it, but uh, the reason I actually brought that up is because I want to honor them by doing exactly what they taught me to do, to define reality by what scripture tells me to um, uh, what reality is. And so uh, so is scripture. And so, uh, that's the reason I brought up that story, and the reason why I'm so adamant about about this. Um, and no, he hasn't. Um, you know, we never. I've never had a fight with anybody over cosmology. I don't argue it with people. Um, <laughs> if people aren't if people are, if people aren't willing or interested, then you know, there's no reason to argue it. Like they're just not ready. Sure. Um, you know, because I never had to argue with anybody. It was just it was something that I I, I just. I wanted, I wanted, I, I believed it because I, I saw it to be true. And that's, that's what it came down to. I, I had that decision when I saw it, I could either accept it or not accept it, right? The red or the blue pill, right? Mm -hmm. And if, and um, so, yeah, so they haven't, he hasn't really spoken to me in about two or three years. Part of the, part of the conflict is a guy named uh, Professor Faulkner. He is the resident astronomer at Answers in Genesis. Now I had mentioned earlier that, um, I grew up in a household that was very based on like on um, ICR, Institute of Creation Research, uh, AIG, and uh, guys like Dr. Henry Morris. A lot of people don't realize that the Young Earth Creationist Movement only really started in the, around 1970, 71. About, it's about 50 years old. It's not that old. Um, before that, in the 1950s, the bulk of the church uh, believed that the earth was millions of years old. And uh, before, long before Darwin ever showed up, the gap theory was already um, uh, very popular in the church based on the natural revelation of geology. So geology came first, and then biology followed afterwards. So what Dr. Henry Morris did, and I'll get into my father and, and some, of the, some of the struggles here, what he did in 1970 is he said, okay, keep in mind the Apollo missions are going off now, right? So, you know, you can kind of, you know, think of, you know, fill in those gaps there, but uh, the, the missing pieces. But he basically came along and said, we're no longer going to go by any natural revelation. We're going to throw all natural revelations out, geology, biology, anything else, but we're going to hold to astrology. We're going to keep to the natural revelation of astronomy, and we're going to throw the rest out. And then the, the other creationist movement was born. What was that? The sky clock. Okay. Oh, I, I'm not familiar with sky clock. Well, it's it's a... You know how the the stars and the luminaries uh, rotate above us, and it's oh, yeah, really, yeah. Okay. it really okay. amounts to a sky clock. But go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, all right. Um, I wasn't sure if you're like referring to like a movie or like a, some or some. But okay, so um, anyways, so what I met, uh, I have I have debated uh, Doctor uh, Fox, uh, Professor Faulkner. Uh, in his office in Answers Genesis, I have gone out there to debate him. I've, I've had you know emails and phone conversations with him, and I have the thing I have argued with him over and over and over again is when I went to, out to Answers in Genesis, uh, I, I said, look, I'm not here to try to convert you guys. 
But what I want from you guys is to actually be honest about what we advocate as flat earthers. Because uh, a guy like Faulkner is actually telling in his – he's actually written my name in his papers, which is a huge embarrassment to my father because I actually refer to them as, as potty literature because if you go into my parents' house, it's right there as the toilet, all their newsletters. <laughs> so when, when Faulkner is actually saying that flat earthers are the devil and they need to be kicked out, removed from your church, and then he talks about Noel J. Hadley, that flat earthers. Uh-oh. That's you can think about how huge. I mean, you know, people like my my parents they believe it because Faulkner tells them to believe it, because yeah. creationist ministries. But here's the problem: when I sat down with him two years ago, the the first time I sat down with him, or actually the second time I sat down with him, I argued. I said, "Look, debate us, please debate us. Like, you know, prove us wrong, but I want you to be honest about what we believe." I said, "Just." Just because if you look at all of their imagery, they show like flying pancakes in space, or they show yeah. like this flat, or they show flat Earth with uh, like people living on top and people living underneath, and like just falling these off things the that like, no, yeah, yeah, it, these things that nobody believes. And I was like, it, why don't? And I asked him. I said, why don't you just show them Hebrew cosmology? And you know, he said, he said he's not going to do it. He told me straight, he's like, I'm not going to do it. And the reason being is because he knows that if he he if he debates uh, Hebrew cosmology, he's going to win the sympathy of his crowd, and, and people are going to wake up to this and go, oh my goodness, that's what the Bible actually says. And, and secondly, he's going to be arguing against the Bible. And so when, what they're doing is they're being purposely deceitful. I mean, mm-hmm. outrageously, purposely lying to the church about oh, yeah. what we're actually advocating. Mm-hmm. And to, to a guy like me, this is really hurtful who grew up in these ministries, right? I was like a punching bag for these guys. And, and so, yeah, so that, that, that is a huge embarrassment in my family because they're getting these newsletters and they're seeing, you know, oh, my son Noel believes in a flying pancake in space because that's what, you know, Professor Faulkner says, right? So, um, you know, it, it's, it's tragic that uh, he showed up at the conference again this year and <laughs> – you know, he published oh, wow. a book like two or three months ago uh, with a, another picture of a flying pancake in space on the cover. And and he's All right. advertising to everyone that he's the, the spokesman for, you know, uh, anyway, I, I'm crazy. rambling. Yeah, now, we're, but- we're coming up on the break here. Noel, I hate to cut you off, buddy, but uh, we're going to come back in just a few minutes with Noel Hadley. We're, we've got a very interesting conversation going on. So stick with us inside the Matrix. Okay, welcome back to Inside the Matrix. We're here with Noel Hadley, and we're having a real fun time here. Uh, You know, every week on this show, uh, pretty much every week, I always remind people that none of us can learn anything if we don't have an open mind. And so that's really the key to moving forward and and growing as as spiritual beings, as intellectual beings, uh, all of those things. with, with that in mind, uh, if somebody thinks you know what we're talking about is crazy, they're certainly welcome to their opinion, and we're not trying to convince anybody of anything whatsoever. But there, there really is. Once you dig into this, you'll you'll find that, like so many of us have, um, the the evidence is pretty much overwhelming. Every ancient culture, as well, uh, the ancient Greeks, the Babylonians. The Japanese, Persian, Viking, uh, or, or Norse, uh, Native American, Hebrew, Mayan, African, Sumerian, Egyptian, Roman. I mean, all of these ancient cultures had depictions of Earth as being flat. And as that the luminaries, the stars, whatever you want to call them, the lights in the sky uh, rotate in a circular fashion above us. And uh, a lot of people refer to that as the sky clock, because really, uh, we can track uh, an entire year uh, using those luminaries in the sky. But anyway, it's very important to you know keep, keep an open mind. You don't have to be convinced of anything, but be willing to listen to ideas that are in conflict with your own in order to, uh, you know, maybe learn something. So what do you think, Noel? Yeah, I... I um... I fully agree with that, and um, that's part of, of a lot of my research uh, in what I call Greek Hellenization, 
and uh, where actually Globe Earth originated from, how it came about. And and you're absolutely correct. Yeah, all the all the ancient cultures, um, some more some till more recent times, uh, believe that the Earth was flat. Um, and <clears throat> If, if you don't mind, I'd like to also clarify because there's a lot of um, I had, we had talked earlier about uh, Daniel Shinton and how I discovered him in 2004, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of confusion out there I think about uh, the modern flat Earth society and when we talk about the flat Earth society, what we're actually talking about because one of the things I, I chronicled in my latest book, The Unexpected Cosmologies, I wanted to show how. These, these lone torchbearers, the guys like Samuel Shenton in the 1960s and then Charles Johnson from the 1970s to the 1990s, um, they, were, they, were, they were heading up what was called the Flat Earth Society. That's very different than what has become of the Flat Earth Society now, uh, which is run by a guy who goes by the name of Daniel Shenton. And, um, and so I just wanted to make that clear because, yeah, a lot of people hear Flat Earth Society and they think it's all – it's it's you know government shows or whatever which is i agree with but not in the 1960s not in the 1970s i think these guys right. were legit guys who were going up against the apollo missions and you know a guy like samuel shenton in 1969 he had only 100 followers and i mean he was it was abysmal how, i mean it was dark for this guy that you know he's here you know people are just mocking him you know that the you know people are landing on the moon supposedly and he's like no guys I, I don't know how to explain this but they're not really landing on the moon and you know he, <laughs> exactly. he couldn't disprove it like we can nowadays but you know so um yeah. anyway he, I just want to throw that the, out there but right he didn't have the technology that we have now so it's much harder to you know pull a fast one on us or on anybody who's actually looking into these things because uh, the the so-called moon landings can be easily shown to be complete frauds, complete fakes. Many people have done it, um, you know, using the photographs, who, using the video that they, they put out. Uh, their own stuff, uh, you know, gives them away. There's, you know, multiple shadow angles. There's so many things that show that it was shot in a studio and not, <laughs> not on the moon. And the fact that it's it's hilarious to me that they you know they have this astronaut Don Pettit that comes out and says, well you know we used to have the technology to go to the moon but we lost it and, and you know it's a painful process to try and get it back. I mean really and they, of course they lost uh, all of the so-called telemetry information everything to do with these moon landings. They just conveniently lost it. You know, uh, gee, we don't know. I think maybe we erased the tapes or we just did something. Uh, you know, supposedly one of the most important things of humankind in all of history. But, you know, we just kind of lost it. And, oh, gee, I don't know if we'll ever get it back. <laughs> yeah, I wish we could just direct uh, Don to the uh, to the Smithsonian. Uh, I I believe I've seen the Apollo 11 capsule there. And we could get some guys, get some measuring tape out and blueprints and, you know. Figure this out. And we could we could uh, you know use a, a you know a, an original smartphone from about 20 years ago, which would be actually be more powerful than the computers that they had back then. I mean, the whole thing is hilarious, and uh, you know the ISS well, you know, is, is just as fake, you know, and uh, you know people have shown the the cables and the green screen, you know, uh, things that have been inputted into those videos. Uh, to make it look like there's stuff floating around. It's just all so fake. It's just a big show. And people say, well, why would they do that? Well, if someone was paying you $50 million a day, <laughs> you think that might be motivation? That's just one reason. But, you know, people don't realize they get $50 million a day. NASA does. Yeah. Yeah, the one thing that um, America seemed to pull off really well was selling this as purely a scientific expedition. Uh, with with a mix of course Cold War uh, ambitions as well, but um, when you one thing that Samuel Shinton did not have at his disposal in the 1960s, nobody in the West knew about was the Russian cosmos. And it wasn't until the Berlin Wall came down, uh, and it wasn't until really the 1990s when we started learning about the Russian cosmos and what was going on with these guys. And this the, the people who actually started uh, the whole rocket, um, uh, if you want to call it a race. Uh, back as early as 1890s, and these guys were were you know transhumanists. The, the, the space was a transhumanist wet dream, and so we haven't even achieved 
you know, the, the ultimate goal. We haven't achieved the ultimate goal yet. We're not there yet. But what's what's so fascinating about these cosmos, and I again I talked a little bit about them in my book, um, is that these guys were these guys were just purely magicians, and they recognized that they were going to do this, you know, by you know, pulling the bunny out of the hat, you know, sawing the woman in half and wowing everybody and, <laughs> you know, it, and wowing the crowds. And so it's really interesting when, to, to look back and see what was, what was going on on the Russian end. Um, and, and now we could, we could look at it from our own eyes and, and see what they were doing. They, that's exactly what they were doing. They were just, uh, it was just all, you know, pure uh, uh, stage performance. Um, yeah, it was stage you know, craft, performance, yeah. wi- performance uh, well i call it performance witchcraft i mean it, yep. it's it, so anyways uh but yeah yeah uh, you were talking about the um all the ancient uh cultures and um you know the thing is is that um one of the things i i research a lot uh before i started uh documenting the modern movement was greek colonization and how Globe Earth, a lot of people don't know this, but Globe Earth, actually, the oldest text we can find where Globe Earth was originated is with Socrates' deathbed in Phaedo, in the book that Plato wrote. And here's, here's – now, a lot of people will debate whether Socrates lived or not, and of course, there's whole other debates in the Flowers Movement about how much of history is actually accurate and so on and so forth. Right. But what's interesting is that Socrates – was uh, he was forced to commit suicide for his charges were corrupting the youth and uh, teaching uh, was it foreign gods, um, and and so that's a very abstract, um, you know, kind of uh, accusations that they uh-huh. killed him for. But what's really interesting on his deathbed is he's he's got this uh, cup of poison hemlock. He's about to drink it, and right before he drinks it, he expounds. Uh, he's got these Pythagoreans there, and which is, I think, Plato jabbing the Pythagoreans because very likely uh, Pythagoras did introduce globe earth first. Uh, but the problem with that is that his students were never allowed to write down his writing. So we know very, you know, he was like, like the great powerful wizard of Oz behind a curtain, and nobody knew what he looked <laughs> like. Um, but he, Socrates is sitting there, and he's like. Before I die, I want to tell you guys what the earth looks like. And a Pythagorean uh, says, yeah, tell us, Socrates, because we've heard you talking about this, and it's such a strange concept to us. And so he describes how the earth is like a ball, and he starts talking about how you can, like, rise above this ball and kind of look down. And he starts getting very, you know, very esoteric in his descriptions. And, uh, and, then he, and they're like, well, tell us more about this, Socrates. And he's like, well, I, I, I would, but I have to drink this poison hemlock, and then I'm going to die. And so he drinks it and he dies. <laughs> and – um, you know, Plato, and I, and I think that's a really interesting because Plato, to this day, uh, many disciplines in the occult, uh, contemporary today and throughout history, have all accused Plato of plagiarizing. He get, he's in a lot of trouble because he has expanded on a lot of secrets from the mystery religions. And, and so it is my personal belief that um, Glover did come out of the mystery religions. Uh, and many other things that Plato expounds upon, which I which I write on. Um, but so when you're looking at the history of globe Earth, and a lot of a lot of flat Earthers sometimes may confuse globe Earth with the Copernican Revolution, which is completely different, because uh, we had Ptolemy as of like what 200 A.D., and he's coming up with the Ptolemaic system of of you know geocentrism. And um, but it all developed in Alexandria, Egypt, in Hellenized times. So by the time you get to um, and, and Copernicus actually just uh, he was just stealing a lot of ideas from Hypatia from about 480. She was in Alexandria, and so by the time you get to the uh, the founding fathers of the Christian faith, these guys were all uh, Platonists and they were all globe earthers and they're actually writing about a globe. And so um, it's really, really difficult when you're looking throughout history to determine how much, how many people were really flat earthers. Because I believe from from about 400 BC on, if you were to be an elite, if you were to graduate from the academy, if you were to, you know, be one of those guys, uh, you know, the Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson guys of your time, right. you're going to be on par with science. You're going to be teaching a globe Earth. Much of the world may not have believed that by that time, 
But it, it's kind of like um, one of the arguments Professor Faulkner used with me in his office. He said that it's proof that people did not believe the Earth was flat because for the last 2,000 years, you see globe Earth being taught in the university. And I told him, I said, well, hold on a second, because if you do any survey of America today, shockingly, a huge percentage of Americans, like I, I don't know the number, it's a huge percentage, do not believe in evolution. At least they put that on paper. Mm-hmm. And, when there's, and so this just perplexes a lot of people in, in, in universities and so on. They're like, how are we failing these people, right? But my point was <laughs> is that if you go to – if but my point is, is if you go to any national park, any museum, any movie theater, anywhere, it's all evolution in your face. So if a thousand years from now, you were to look back at the year 2019, you would say nobody believed – um, and young, uh, every, or they would say everybody believes in evolution. Proof is that it's taught everywhere, right? Well, that's not the proof. No. But um, all that to say that I do think that there was a there was a huge movement of flat earthism for the last two thousand years, and of course geocentrism even beyond uh, Copernicus uh, a few hundred years ago. But um, it's obviously not going to be taught in the university. So that's, it's really, it, we're, if we're looking there, we're not going to find uh, the answers we're seeking. Yeah, that's for sure. And um, before we get too far down the road, I want to make clear uh, about the Flat Earth Society, modern Flat Earth Society today. Yes. If you do a search for Flat Earth on Google or most of the mainstream search engines, that's going to be one of the first things that pop up. And there's a reason for that. Because you look at there and they have all kinds of crazy, ridiculous ideas that nobody, I mean, nobody that's looked into Flat Earth subscribes to at all. And you had mentioned before that, you know, people are disingenuous a lot of times and and they make accusations uh, of people that have looked into Flat Earth and, and, and have come to that conclusion that they believe certain things that are just crazy because... You know, there's that graphic image that many of us saw as children where there's a ship going over the edge of a flat earth, right? It's like falling off the flat earth over the edge. And that image is so powerful that many people still, you know, will parrot that back to you when you start talking about it. But there, you know, anybody that's looked into this flat earth movement realizes there's not an edge like that that you can fall off of at all. Nobody believes that, but yet they'll throw that out there as if, if as, as if it's true. And uh, the flatter society is there to uh, further, you know, distract people from, you know, doing their own research on this. So it's become much more difficult. Uh, YouTube is very much the same way. If you type in flat Earth, there'll be all of the so-called debunkers and you know, be pages and pages of videos saying, Oh yeah, it's crazy. I don't know why people think that they're so stupid, yada, yada, yada. You're not going to get to the really good, uh, videos and good evidential, uh, videos until you go way, way, way down the list. And that's why, uh, you know, websites like yours, uh, I think it's called our way is the highway dot wordpress dot com. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. If you go on there and you look at a lot of the people that you have interviewed, you know, for your latest book, you're going to find those people are the real deal. And those those are the ones out there who have seriously looked in this. They've done scientific experiments. They've actually used the scientific process, you know, that that textbooks claim, which are our scientists don't really use at all. They, matter of fact, the, most of the physics that we have is based entirely on theory, and that's not a scientific method at all. Yeah, and I, I actually had a, uh, a friend contact me a couple months ago when we were in uh, Ireland, and he's like, he was asking me all these questions about, he was actually genuinely curious about the flat earth, and he was asking me all these questions. He's like, I'm trying to search this stuff out. I, I can't find anything but debunking stuff. And I told him, yeah, I said, you know, I'm really sorry. Like, I wish, I wish you had researched this in 2017 or 2016 because back then it was glorious. I mean, you right. type in a keyword and it, and it comes up. But it the would information. all come up, yeah, immediately, yep. yeah. Yeah. But not and, anymore. Um, they, they, they push that way down with their algorithms or out of it completely. Yeah. 
Yeah. I just had a, I had this amazing point. I just want to make, I <laughs> had a brain fart. Um, but yeah, and that's, and that's one of the things that actually is, I believe important about the book I write, I wrote and what I'm continuing to write in Chronicle is, and I'm just, what I'm doing now is I'm just going down the list and I'm interviewing uh, flat earthers across the board. And I'm just taking down their stories and their experiments and, and their experiences. And what I'm hoping is, uh, my book, The Unexpected Cosmology, is a much more it, it's a much more intimate, personal look at people's lives. Mm-hmm. So if people are looking just purely for experiments, they're not going to necessarily get it there. But a lot of people who may be uh, shy of of some of these um, of you know some of the flat Earth info, I'm hoping that they'll be attracted to read the people behind it, which will then kind of lead them further on or vice versa people who are actually you know been into the flat earth movement for some time to actually enjoy reading the stories of the you know the people who were motivated by the information i was at the beach about a week ago and you know you were talking about the ships sailing over the 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 edge and that of course you know when i would see that as a kid that never sat right with me i would think about things like but wouldn't that cause like all the currents to be really fast and like you know like you know if all the water yeah, the water, that'd be, like, a water you know yeah. yeah but i i was at the beach uh last week just sitting there watching the sunset and i was on uh near pensacola and if anyone is familiar with the gulf coast there it's really beautiful because you're facing south and in the winter uh, because the sun is in the southern hemisphere you see this the sunrise and the sunset right there it just comes up right. and down boom boom yep. And and so we were camping there for a month on the beach, uh, right after we came back from Europe. And there was these these people, and it was interesting how many people are actually talking about flat Earth now. A lot of people really are talking about it. Most of them are mocking it. And I was sitting there watching the sunset, and this whole party of about ten people, a family, they were there for Thanksgiving, were uh, they were they were just mocking this idea of the flat Earth. They were all talking and laughing about it. And as the sun is going down, they're just laughing like, oh, no, there it is going over the edge of the earth. Ah, you know, and I was just I was just sitting there going, man, this the arrogance, you know, it's just pure arrogance. Like they 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 don't they I don't know if they don't know or if they don't want to know. I don't know which it is. Um, but, it, yeah, it was just it was tragic that that image of, you know, sailing over the edge of the earth is so ingrained in people's minds. They can't they can't get past that. Well, and also the ships disappearing over the curvature of the Earth, and that's so, so easily shown to be an error because it's uh, when ships disappear, it, that's that's a uh, attribute of our ability to see. It has nothing to do with the ship actually disappearing. And if you have uh, one of those Nikon P900s or P1000s or a telescope or anything like that, you can go ahead and watch, and, and when you can't see that ship anymore, you pull out that camera or that telescope and zoom in, and there it is. You can see it just plain as day. Um, Absolutely. But it's, people and it's don't almost get embarrass- that. It's almost embarrassing because uh, for Globe Earth because that was uh, the ship disappearing at sea was first observed at Alexandria. So remember, Alexandria is in Egypt. Uh, after Alexander the Great, leading up to Cleopatra, in those years, it was very pivotal for globe Earth. And they're developing, uh, that's where Aristosthenes, you know, measured the Earth. Right, he not only sticks. measured it, he took, he, he got, <laughs> yeah, with a friend and a couple of sticks, he not only measured it, he then measured the heavens, and then he flipped the Earth on its axis, uh, which I don't know, I, I, I mean, that just, that's crazy. But, but it was there in Alexandria where, you know, like the first uh, atheist, uh, philosophers are rising up, the first heliocentrist uh, 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 philosophers, but that's where the ship disappearing at sea first was observed from the lighthouse there at Alexandria, and it was one of the first proofs they used to see the Earth is not flat, it's a globe, and that has been so thoroughly you know, debunked. It's, it's ridiculous that people are still pushing that because it's, it's – it's, I, I, I don't know. I mean, just you get up in an airplane 30,000 feet up and you look down and there's you can, it's, it just keeps expanding out. There's no curve. I mean, you could, you know, whatever. But yeah, and the horizon um, rises up to, to see you and that would never happen on yeah. a globe. It, it's, it can only happen on a flat surface. So yeah, there is so many when people get into this, they, they just don't realize how many proofs there are against it. Even back in the 19th century. 
they did experiments to, you know, to show whether the earth was actually moving or not. And they proved that it does not move, but yet all of that had to be, you know, stifled and, and buried. Yeah, they, yeah, that the, the ether is moving. And this is something that I also chronicle. Um, and so my book, The Unexpected Cosmology, it goes up to the year 2017. And then the one I'm working on now, the, the direct follow-up is from 17 to present to 19. And it covers all the speakers at the Flat Earth International Conferences. And Bob Nodal uh, and guys like Chris Van uh, Maitri and others in Flat Earth Core have been using these gyros gyroscopes to absolutely just blow any movement out of the water. Like there is, yep. it is they have so thoroughly debunked I that know. the Earth – we're coming up on the break, Noel. Sorry to cut you off <laughs> again, but we've got okay. about 30 seconds here. So we're going to take a short pause. Once again, we're here with Noel Hadley. We'll be back in just a few minutes. So stick around with us. Throw us a question on the chat and uh, enjoy uh, the show. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back to Inside the Matrix, everybody. Hope you're having a wonderful time. We're here with Noel Hadley. And... Uh, Okay, where do we want to pick up from here, Noel? What were we talking about last? <laughs> I don't know, because we, we we always have a conversation on the break, and we get off on all these different tangents. You know, one thing that, that's interesting to me uh, in going through your book is is all the different people uh, that have been involved in, in bringing uh, Flat Earth to the forefront. Uh, one of the guys, uh, Eric Dubay, who's very been very prolific in a lot of the things that he's brought forward about flat earth. But the, the sad part is uh, a lot of these people's egos really get in the way. And so he's felt threatened. You know, here's a guy, I think he's originally from the United States, but lives in Thailand. Um, but he wants to take credit for the whole movement, basically. And other people, when they came out, you know, he basically tried to discredit most of them and, and call them shills and things like that. And that, it's just so unnecessary. And it's so sad to see in, uh, you know, a group of people like this that there are those who will engage in that kind of thing. Yeah, what Eric Dubay did uh, is he basically took a lot of the work from the synthetics, uh, the, the British uh, geocentric astronomers of you know, the like 19th Robotham century. And yeah. yeah, and Sam Robotham, and he repackaged them. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I, I I haven't been hugely impressed with uh, Dubé's work for that reason. That he kind of just he he takes other people's works, repackages it, which is you know you know great for him. And I'll give him that. But you know, he, he takes a lot of credit for himself. So what he started doing very early on, and this is the reason why in my book is I. My book was written very organically. It was basically just interviewing all these different flat earthers, asking them questions, just kind of like you're doing here, and they tell me their story. And, and one thing that kept coming up was Eric DeBay. I mean, Eric DeBay has just burned so many bridges. And one of the things that uh, David Weiss, uh, who I believe you had on your show uh, last week or something, right. mm -hmm. he, was he was telling me about uh, DeBay is that he DeBay wanted – he wanted all the information essentially to be filtered through him. It was basically, what does Eric Dubay believe? And if he doesn't believe it, he doesn't want you talking about it. <laughs> and, and so what he started doing very early on is he started coming up with his, his wall of shame, his, his show list. And it just started right. throwing all these, you know, this guy's a show and this woman's a show and this guy's a show and this one, because, you know, they all, they're not talking about things I want to talk about or the information I want to push. And so, um, and one of the things that um, started coming out of that is when he started dressing up uh, like he started dressing up like Mark Sargent and pretending to be Mark Sargent or you know right. whoever. Or but, Patricia. But but yes, and but when he dressed up like Patricia Steer, it had other connotations because now you've got a guy dressing up in drag. Right. And so that's one of the things that came up. Uh, so a, a lot of your um, viewers may, probably don't know may not know who Patricia Steer is. And I, I spoke at the last conference in Dallas, the Flat Earth International Conference, and Robbie Davidson, who puts it on, he wanted me to speak on, on my experience with Patricia Steer. And I knew I was in trouble. This was a Q&A. So I knew I was in trouble when I stood up on stage, and I, 
I ask for a raise of hands. How many people here know who Patricia Steer is? And maybe maybe a third of the room r- rose uh, raised their hands. I'm like, I'm really? in so much trouble because, oh, wow. yeah. And, and then I then I asked, okay, tell me like who here knows who Mark Sargent is? Everybody raised their hand, and which which is surprising again. Not that everyone knew who Mark Sargent was, but that Patricia and and Mark in the early years were kind of, you know, together all the time making videos. Yeah, you yeah. kind of like a Regis and Kathy Lee, uh-huh. and so. When I when I interviewed, so this summer I was in France. I was in the Dordogne Valley, kind of near, uh, kind of close to Spain, I guess. Um, and and I received word that Patricia Steer had killed all of her social media, pulled the plug, YouTube, Facebook, email, Skype, everything, and she just left. She's gone. And uh, so I got a hold of Rick Hummer, who. Uh, he's done a lot of work with Rob Skiba and he was the MC at the, the conferences. And I said, is there any way you can get me in contact with her? Well, it just so happened that the Rick Hummer was one of like the two or three people who actually had her phone number. So he's like, yeah, I can get, so Patricia didn't know who I was. And, um, we had actually, we had actually only met once at the first conference in Raleigh in 2017, because I sat right behind her. And I, I, uh, I was really excited because Jaron is up there speaking, and there's just all this energy in the room, and I wanted to capture it. So I snapped this picture, and the back of Patricia Steer's head is in the photo. And so I, upload, I put it on Facebook. Patricia, apparently, she saw the photo on Facebook, and she turns around because somebody had said in the comment section to pull her wig. And she said – she told me, she said, go ahead and pull it. It's all natural. And that was our introduction. But – uh, and so we, we, as she interviewed on the phone, and this was like a 10-day interview she gave. I mean, it was a heartbreaking. There were times I was crying, and she's just kind of going through the story for life. And she brought up Eric DeBay. And Eric DeBay was one of the instigators who started this whole thing on how Patricia Steer is a man. And and so I guess I'm kind of going back to Eric DeBay here, the um, – you know, the, yeah, I mean, there's this – that the, there's moral there's moral consequences to everything we do mm-hmm. and he has he has he has burned so many he has he, as as david weiss said in the book he said eric de bay has done more damage to flat earth than anybody else if you can if you can think about that more than anybody else because he is the number one instigator out there just attacking people left and right. And I'm surprised he hasn't attacked me yet. I don't know. He knows who I am and I've written him recently and he's just kind of sitting on it, but I'm waiting on it because that's just what he does. So, well, I gotta, uh, and it's a I shame. Because say, go ahead. It's a shame because he started out. He did. He brought a lot of people into this movement. There's no doubt about that. Um, so it's, it, it, it's a shame that people who, He's attacking. He's attacked people who he brought into the movement. If you can just, I mean, fathom yeah. that. You know, like Karen, Karen, Karen B. Karen B. was introduced to Flatter through Eric DeBay, and then within months of her putting on her first YouTube uh, 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 video, he puts her up on his uh, show wall of shame. So, you know, just try to figure that one out. It's sad, and I gotta say, I love Patricia Steer. I think she's awesome. I'm really sad that she, you know, had to pull the plug, but I totally understand, you know, based on people attacked her right and left. She's a beautiful woman. She's articulate. She's very interesting. She has a wonderful voice and she had a great show. It was called Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. And when she first came out, I was really excited because I thought, well, you know, right now and in this movement, there's only a bunch of guys out there talking. And now we've got this really um charismatic lady very attractive who can present herself very well and i even wrote a a little theme song for her because i was excited to you know see her get out there and start doing her thing and she did a great job for so many years but she was viciously attacked from you know a dozen different people and i think the I don't know if it's just jealousy or, or or what in the world. I mean, she was always very sincere and very open about everything, but people would just accuse her of the craziest things, and it, it's just sad. And a lot of them were obviously just dis, uh, disinfo agents, you know, that attacked her. But there were some others too that that had no reason to do that. And then yeah, I think uh, there's a 
Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't interrupt. There is definitely a lot of – so when I – this is how this book came about, The Unexpected Cosmology. I'm in France interviewing Patricia Steer, and the reason I wanted to write on her is because you know it, it was almost like the image um, in the Gospel of uh, John of the, of the woman supposedly caught in adultery that's flung down at Jesus' feet. And, and, you know, there's been much noted on this account how the, the, the man is not present and they unlawfully accuse her of all these things and stuff like that. And, and, and I, I, I saw Patricia like just flung down in the dirt. And for me, it was, it was just a matter of why isn't anybody offering hand to pick her up? That that's all it came down to for me. I just wanted someone to, everyone was silent and I wanted someone to stand by her and say, you know what? What those people did to you was was wrong. And when I was when I was interviewing her and I was writing the story, it was the hardest thing I ever had to write. Um, it, I didn't sleep for almost a week. By the end of it, after like several days, like hardly any sleep, I couldn't even read my own words anymore. It was just, it was like a it was a thirty three thousand, uh, thirty three, thirty four, thirty five thousand, something like that. Uh, uh, a word article is huge. It was almost like a mini novel. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, um, when I published it, I thought I, I would be destroyed. I thought that would be the end of me. Like, I thought everyone was going to attack me. I thought everyone, you know, that's, that I, I actually wrote that as my farewell letter. Like, bye, guys. I, I'm going to write this, and I'm, I'm going to leave now. And I was shocked by this, the amount of support people have, have given. And neither Patricia nor I expected so many people to say, you know, you know, I, I stand up with, with Patricia. I don't, you know, all those accusers, they're wrong and all that kind of stuff. And so that's how this whole thing came about. Uh, but yeah, this made me a target too. I mean, every day now it's like, you know, I can't go anywhere. I, you know, show up on social media without people saying, oh, he's a show. He's a disinformation agent. All because I stood up for Patricia and, and told her story, let her tell her own, you know, story. Um, so there's just, there's just a lot of that out there. And it's uh, her, her ultimate downfall uh, you 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 probably know this that in this in this uh, business in the truther community you got to have thick skin because you're dealing with you're dealing with people who are calling you crazy all sorts of names on the other end of the spectrum right yeah. <laughs> but 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 even within even within the truther community people are you know they're questioning you like you know who is this guy where does he come from and you know and this kind of stuff and is everybody a shell and all and so. It's it, you gotta have really thick skin, and the one thing she didn't do, the reason she ultimately had to pull the plug, is because she became so obsessed with um, with what everyone was saying negatively about her, and so she was actually giving them more power, and she would just keep reading their their comments and going to their channels and, and over and over and over again, and that's something you just can't do. You know, I, I've had right. many people make videos make videos about me. I just won't watch them. I'm just not interested because it's like, I care about sleeping at night. Right. I just want to have a good night's sleep. So, um, yeah. Well, here's the thing. We, you know, we all know who we are. We know what our core values are. We know what our moral compass is and it doesn't matter what somebody else says or thinks about us because that's their opinion. You know, that's their yeah. issue. It's not ours. And once we under, you know, fully understand that you do, it enables you to develop a thick skin and anybody that's puts themselves out there, you know, in the public has a show or is presenting information, you know, you're just going to be susceptible to that kind of um, attack. It just happens. So you just have to let it go because we know who we are. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, it was a shame because yeah, as you know, with Patricia, she, uh, it, she brought, so she introduced us to many, uh, people within the movements. They, we yep. know who they are because they went on her show and that's something she pointed out to me. She said, even her own attackers follow these other people because they were on her show because she introduced uh, them. It's almost uh, ironic, right? It is. It is incredibly ironic. And People don't understand how really sincere she was and how truthful she was. They they think she just made up all this story and they were saying, oh, she's the CIA and yada, yada, yada. Uh, it's just yeah. crazy. And, and I, I really feel bad for her, but I hope she's doing well now and uh, gotten out of the whole rat race of people 
you know, attacking her. So I hope things are much better for her now. Well, I hope so too. And, um, it, you know, when I, it, it was, it was something I always kind of cherished that, that time that I was able to interview her over those 10 days. And it was just very, very raw. And it was, it was very clear. I was, I was speaking with a woman who was, you know, deeply hurt and, you know, she had some very, um, you know, yeah, very, very raw things to say. And I, you know, I, I had the chance to talk to Mark Sargent about afterwards because she said things about him and, and uh, he was like, yeah, it, it was, it was fair. I mean, you know, yeah. So it, uh, it's, yeah. Anyways. And that's how this whole book came about. Uh, Robbie Davidson, again, the, the person who was put on the flat earth international conferences, he actually stepped down about two weeks ago. So he will no longer be putting on FEIC, um, he did the first four, the one in Raleigh and then Edmonton, Canada, and then, you know, uh, Denver and Dallas. Uh, I was talking with him. I was talking with Rob Skiba and a couple other guys. And they're like, hey, you know, let's let's turn our stories into a book. And so that's how this whole thing came about because of the reaction to the Patricia Steer piece. And, um, and you know, her story is very organic. And I put that together. And then I basically formed the entire uh, book around that article I wrote, uh, which was called originally, it was called "Everything That Was Beautiful Became Ugly," and that was a direct quote from her toward the end of our interview when she was just kind of gazing back on her experiences and seeing how this whole movement was just this amazing experience for her. Now, now she just looks at it as just pure, you know, dark and ugly, and and you know, so on. That's why she had to move on. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's sad things like that happen, but pretty much every you know, all people that are uh, putting out information that seems somewhat new, although it's it's old in, in so many ways. But, uh, you know, people are going to attack them because a lot of core beliefs are based on certain things that people hold true, you know, and the globe Earth is one of them. And when you start questioning something as foundational as where we live, and that type of you know cosmology, it rattles people's cages and it gets them very upset unless they're at a point in their life where they are able to be more objective and have more of an open mind. You know, you know what it is for me is, you know, I, I'm coming from a Christian background here. And so um, I, I, I've talked to many uh, Sola Scriptura guys about this who reject uh, Hebrew cosmology. It's funny because they... Uh, you know, if you know your Reformation history, John Calvin uh, was was huge on 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 this. The, what's called the doctrine of accommodation, uh, that you know that all the Hebrew cosmology within Scripture was actually not inspired by God. That that was like one of the few sections inspired by men and blah blah blah. But anyways, uh, w w the reason the reason I, from where I'm standing, a lot of a lot of Christians are able to look in Scripture. They're able to look and see Hebrew cosmology. They're able to look out and make general observations and see that, you know, you can't bend, you know, the surface of water and all these kind of things, right? It's obviously, you know, that we're not moving. You look around and we're sitting still and we're not spinning a thousand miles, blah, blah, blah. The thing is, is what I find is that they, they hold the globe up to their bosom and they can't let it go. And, and some of those guys really might be NASA space uh, boy fans, but mm -hmm. most of them... It has nothing to do with the shape of the earth, and it has everything to do with the shape of humanity. And I, I tell people all the time that for me, for me, what's so amazing about the flat earth experience is that it has very little to do with the shape of the earth, and it's, it is the shape of humanity. And what they look in that globe, they see everything that they're going to have to give up if, if, they, if they surrender to Hebrew cosmology because they see uh, – they they see everything that's you know that's a part of that globe that's a part of their lives that they love so dearly. Um, the scripture verse that did it for me that really you had talked you know during the commercial break about the the parasites. I think you use the word parasites. The the <laughs> is, is it okay to say that. that oh yeah, absolutely. That, um, okay. Uh, well, the, the the scripture verse that uh, did it for me that just blew my mind. There's a there's a there's a passage in a couple gospels where uh, Satan is tempting uh, Jesus in the wilderness, and he takes him to a very high mountain, and he and he points and he shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. And now this is used many times for you know flat earth proof. I, I, I that's irrelevant to me, 
because this is getting into the shape of humanity here. And he shows them all the kingdoms of the earth, and he says, if you bow down and worship me, I'll hand these to you. And Jesus never rebukes him for that. He never said, he never disagrees. Go, no, these are really mine. Like he says throughout the gospels, this you know, my kingdom is not of this world. And that was the first time I go, like, oh my goodness, like it finally occurred to me that like everything that I had held dear before, everything from politics to Hollywood to you know, to, you know, the Vatican, the uh, Zionism, you know, everything you name it, Parliament, you just you go across the list, and that all belongs to satan it's all his oh yeah and exactly and right this is all his narrative it's all his story this is all his indoctrination and his religion and everything you know scientism is truly the greatest people argue whether it's islam or christianity or catholicism it's scientism scientism is the greatest biggest religion in the world and it encompasses its tentacles in all religions and all facets of life and when I saw that, that, that's what did it for me. And that's what I saw in the globe. And that's mm-hmm. what people have such a hard time giving up. I think that's it. I think that's what it comes down to. It's not, it's not, it's not curvature. It's not whether we're moving or the sun is moving. It's, it's that. Because that's all in the narrative. Yeah, what a great point that is. I, I really I concur with that. It's so true. Now, now as I was... As, a, as I was researching, I talk about Hollywood, one of my favorite movies, I don't even watch movies anymore, but one of my favorite movies in the past was Forrest Gump. I actually really like that movie. Some people, <laughs> it's like a love, hate, some people hate that movie. It's like a love-hate relationship. Uh, but, but, but what's interesting about that film is that every scene, uh, the, 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 one of the themes of the film is movement. And every scene uh, either has... Uh, like the three main characters, you know, like uh, uh, Jenny can't fly and uh, uh, Lieutenant Dan, you know, he doesn't, he lost his legs and Forrest Gump is running and it, either there's like they're overcoming some handicaps or whatever. But what, when I, when I was researching this book, The Unexpected Cosmology, and I'm interviewing like Mark Sargent and Patricia Steer and Shelley Lewis and Robbie Davidson and Rob Skiba and Rick Hummer and David Weiss, you know, Zen Garcia, Bob Nodal, you know, Paul on the Plane, Chris Bailey, all these people. It, it, it was amazing because it was almost like I was writing a, a, a Forrest Gump movie where all these different people, they're making up the fabric of America. Like, you know, like Zen Garcia is a, is a deadhead. He was back in the 90s. He was actually a deadhead. Or, you know, or um, Chris and Liz Bailey, if, uh, they, they uh, run what's called the Take on the World conferences. Uh, and they run Take on the World TV on YouTube. They were actually a part of the geocentric movement out of Cleveland in the 1990s. A lot of people don't know that that was a real thing before Flat Earth was a geocentric movement. Um, and so it just, you know, and then you have Shelley Lewis who, you know, went to West Point, became a lieutenant. And yeah, the, you know, the list awesome. goes on. <laughs> she is. She's an amazing woman. I was, <laughs> I was in the Army and, uh, you know, just your, your grunt private. And and I, I was really like nervous speaking to her because over the phone, because every time I met a lieutenant in the army, it's because I'm in trouble, right? Like, you know, you're being sent to the lieutenant's <laughs> office. So, you know, she's like, I'm like, you know, like, you know, do, do I say yes, sir? You know, what do I call you? And, and um, <laughs> All right. Hold that, anyways, thought. Um, hold that thought. No, we're going to take another short pause right here. And uh, yeah, let's let's talk about uh, the diversity of, of a lot of these people that have come to this conclusion that we have as well. You're listening to Inside the Matrix with Noel Hadley. We're going to take a short pause right here. We'll be back with the final segment, so stick around with us. Jimmy Brent. All right, welcome back, everybody. We're here with Noel Hadley. And before we get uh, back into it, um, I wanted to reach out and say thank you to Shelley Lewis for recommending you as a guest. Uh, that was a, a great move on her part. So thank you, Shelley, if you ever listen to this. And uh, we were just discussing how diverse the backgrounds are of the people that you interviewed for your latest book. So if you want to keep going with that, Noel. Yeah, uh, one of the uh, things that really struck me is how many uh Shelley Lewis is one good example. She went to um, she went to West Point, and West Point is something I've always been fascinated since the time I was a little boy. But she went to West Point because she wanted to be the first woman to walk on the moon. That was her. She had basically plotted out everything she needed to do from the time she was a a pretty much a preteen, 
And same thing with Rob Skiba. Rob Skiba wanted to enter the space program. So he joined the Army to become a helicopter pilot. And he was doing everything he could to enter the space program. And a lot of these individuals who entered the Flat Earth Movement, you know, they're, they're highly educated. They did their time, their service to their country. Um, you know, they didn't start out this journey uh, wanting to, like, you know, attack America or, you know, just bring down the establishment. Like, they started out fully indoctrinated, fully on board with the, with the, the agenda. And, and so th- that, that's been something really fascinating. But what a, a, a bigger theme that I'm seeing in this is that the whole Copernican model is one of the, one of the big, I hate this question. Why would they lie? I get asked that all the time. Like, why would they lie? <laughs> yeah. And I always respond like, why does anybody lie? We all, like everybody has lied, right? Like, so think in the time when you lied, like, what, what were you trying to get out of that? Right? Like, you know, <laughs> it was, it was something for your benefit, either in that moment or something else. But, but, um, the, the, the Copernican, the whole Copernican revolution, as we're just drifting aimlessly through this, this, you know, cosmos, this black sackcloth of space, and there's, you know, there's no meaning, it's all pointless, you know, all these, you think of like all these um, documentaries, and they, they, they love showing, the, it's like Discovery Channel, National Geographic, or, or whatever, just some sitcom, it, it doesn't really matter, anything on Netflix, they love showing these shots of space, you know, I mean, Earth from outer space, and you kind of, and then the next shot, like, it shows people aimlessly walking along in New York City, just looking at their cell phones, waiting for a subway, and it's it's just to show, like, we're just this, we're on this meaningless speck, right? We're just, everything is pointless, and so, so many of these individuals, guys like Bob Nodal and David Weiss, and, and, and interviewing these people, a lot of these people, they started out as or, or Patricia Steer, uh, they started out as like uh, atheist, uh, ag- agnostics, or others, and all of a sudden, when they realize that they've been lied to about everything, when the curtain is pulled back, you start to realize, you actually, you don't have a choice but to come to the conclusion, when you, when you come to the conclusion that, that not only that the Earth is flat, that we're actually in an enclosed dome, that we're, there's actually a solid firmament above us. Now, not all flat earthers hold this view, but the majority do, and I, I'm pretty sure that just about everyone I interviewed in the book does. You, 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 you have to come to a conclusion that there is a creator, and this is something that the, the, heliocentric, the heliocentric model with, and even with Star Wars and Star Trek, it all pushes people away from that into agnosticism, atheism, or just some sort of like... Scientism. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, or just or maybe a better word would, uh, would be apathy, just totally apathetic to anything of, of spiritual nature, anything religious. And, and so what the Flat Earth Movement has done is it is bringing in thousands upon thousands of people who, um, who are finally having to confront the fact that there is a creator, and that creator has a name, he has an identity, and, and who is it? Let's find that out. And now people come to different conclusions, um, or some people like Patricia Steer or uh, David Weiss or others have been like, okay, we know there's a God, now we know there's a creator. We're not sure who that is yet, but we're, we're looking. And that's what's incredible about this movement. Uh, guys like uh, Paul on the plane, I'm not sure um, if you know who he is. He's kind of my, yes. kind of my new BFF. He's my new BFF now. We actually <laughs> just met for once last week. Uh, right. He's just an incredible, incredible guy. I love Paul. Uh, and he was like your – I mean this guy was all out Star Wars. He, when, when Disney bought Star Wars back in – I think it was 2012, right in there, from uh, when they bought Lucasfilm, he was like – it was this, it was this amazing moment for a lot of fanboys because they realized that they could get in from the ground floor and kind of you know, rise really quickly in something they knew would be huge. And so he was a podcaster on Star Wars. He had a YouTube, and you know, he's just all out. Uh, blogging Star Wars, everything he had like a, uh, <laughs> he had this uh, he can he had this like um, stormtrooper outfit that like what he had to mold and like you know cut and stuff like that, which right. is still in a box in his garage to this day. He never he was like about halfway finished with it, and he when he stumbled upon Flat Earth, uh, he said <laughs> he said That's Flat it. Earth uh, ruined his yeah he said flat he he jokes when he says this but he said Flat Earth ruined his life because 
he just he couldn't <laughs> stomach all that stuff anymore. Just all those lies that he was constantly being fed uh, in all that entertainment. So, um, mm-hmm. but that's what this is doing to people. It's just it's it's this explosive. Uh, movement of people just searching for the creator now. And I've never seen anything like this before. All those years when I was a young creationist, arguing for like a, like a seven day uh, a week uh, creation, like 6,000 years ago and evolution is a lie and that stuff. I, all those times I would argue with atheists or agnostics or people of other faiths, no one ever said, would look at the evidence, go, well, no, I think you're right. I think the earth was created over seven days. But now you have all these people going, wait a second, the earth is flat. This is geocentric. We're not moving. We're not going anywhere. Like for the first time, people are like, wow, I'm going to start investing. <laughs> maybe, no, maybe you are right. I'm going to start investigating, you know, more of scripture and seeing what it has to say. So that's, that's what is just mind blowing for me to watch um, this mass, this mass um, exodus of people trying to just, I guess you could call it the matrix, right? I mean, just yeah. trying to get out of here. Yeah. Just break, breaking, just trying to... breaking down the programs. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, that's a great point. And just the fact that people are willing to question everything and many, many of us are, and there's nothing wrong with that because the truth will always stand up to scrutiny. It's the lies that have to constantly be maintained and reinforced because they are lies. And we, you know, we're discovering that. And many, many, many of us out there have, have uh, broken our programming, have opened up our minds to the possibilities. And, and the more you go down that road, you realize how little we actually know. But we can for sure decipher a lot of the lies that have been given to us. And uh, where we live is, is a big one. Yeah, the more we go down, you're right. The more we go down this road, the more we realize how little we know. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, 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 I've been in this for you know a few years now, just short of a few months. You know when you came into it, and I, I'm just, I, yeah. I mean, I know. I feel like I know less now than, uh, def- <laughs> those early <laughs> than those early months. I mean, it's yeah. So, you know, another great. Um, so I wrote this book really organically, and. Um, I wanted to, in, in the in the spirit of what Patricia Steer did on Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes, because the entire book came out of that article to begin with, uh, is, you know, I, I basically handed the microphone to other people and have them tell me their story. And and in the spirit of Patricia Steer, one uh, woman I interviewed is Karen B. And she spoke in at the, at the Flat Earth Conference in Denver. And she was also, she was at all of them, but... Um, and she wanted to talk about Bigfoot. Now, a lot of people would say, why are you putting Bigfoot into a, uh, a biography on the flat earth movement? Well, when she came into it, so she lives on a property in North Carolina in the woods, and she claims that she uh, you know, has had multiple, multiple Bigfoot encounters, and she goes into detail on it. But the thing was is that when she entered the movement, people were all like, you know, that's embarrassing. Don't talk about it. You know, that's – you're like derailing the movement and, you know, just just shut up about Bigfoot already. But she talked about how when Patricia Steer finally – when she invited her on uh, Hot Potatoes, she handed her the microphone and Karen B. talked about Bigfoot. And and the fact that Patricia Steer let her just talk about – you know, who she was and what she was experiencing, you know, who she was as a person, uh, that really meant a lot for her. And so sure. as I was writing, as I was writing this book, I tried to do that very thing. You know, who is Zen Garcia? Well, you know, let's talk about his years where he actually traveled around as a deadhead, you know, and, and, you know, who is Rob Skiba? You know, let's talk about, you know, coming out of his, you know, divorce and, you know, and all, all these just hardships and struggles that people had. And, you really see that these people are, are truly the real people. They're not just these, they're not just these YouTube personalities. You know, they're not just these faces on your screen. They're actually real flesh and blood people like us, and they struggle with real things. And, um, and that was one of the things that just really excited me about being able to do this. And again, I'll go back to Chris and Liz Bailey. Um, their stories were exciting because they met in high school. Uh, they were actually. Uh, geocentrists back in the 90s like i i've never heard of geocentrists before i didn't know that was a thing um 
but you know that was a, re- a very real thing in Cleveland, and the geocentric movement was really just taking off. After it started in the 1960s, it was really taken off around 2012, 2013, uh, with, uh, what was it, The Principal? Uh, if you've heard of that film with uh, Dr. Um, what is his name? I, I wrote it on my book. Um, and then Flat Earth came along in 2015 and just completely <laughs> just pulverized the geocentric movement. Like, they, you know, they were really upset. Oh, it's Sir Genis, Dr. Sir Genis. I, he did the movie, the documentary, The Principal, which is a really good documentary. I recommend anyone watching. Um, and um, yeah, so they just got pulverized uh, by the flat earth movement. It just took over everything in 2015, but they were just taking off. And so it was kind of exciting to be able to like write about these people and what they went through and, um, and how we've all come from these different areas of life, different religions, different beliefs, uh, different life goals, uh, disasters but we all kind of came to this this conclusion together that you know we've been lied to about almost everything Mm -hmm. yeah and it it goes through every aspect of our lives and that's what once you realize you know that very very fundamental things we've been lied to it's much easier to realize the rest of it you know i mean we are living in a world controlled by very, very dark uh, entities. And uh, they have structured society and culture to suit their agenda. These people are parasitic in nature. They live off of our energy, off of our creativity. And um, they are fully bent on creating a, a globalist world with one world government fully controlling and manipulating every single aspect of our lives. And they've, you can see the evidence of that everywhere. So once you realize the very fundamental things that we've been lied to about us, such as where we live, uh, you begin to see it's, it's an eye opening. It's, it's not just about flat earth. It's a very eye opening awareness that occurs to so many people. I mean, I've been into, this thing for not flat earth, but I've been into, you know, understanding the world and what's really going on for about 30 years. So uh, I had a a pretty big advantage coming into this once I saw this information, because I knew the depth of the deception in so many other areas. It was not hard for me to to see it, Um, but it, it opens people up to the possibilities. And that's super important. You know, I can't stress that enough. Can I give a, a quick story? I was, uh, sure. Uh, when <laughs> we were living in Europe this last year, one of the things I was targeting because I was wanting to work on a worthless mysteries part two, which is just uh, just more digging into the mystery religion. And um, and one thing I was targeting and hitting up in Europe was um, uh, was Renaissance uh, culture and Renaissance architecture and trying to kind of finger what they were. Uh, you know, really, it, what they were really pushing during that time, and so you go visit like King Louis the Fourteenth, his stuff, and he actually worshipped Apollo. I mean, it's just in your face, he worshipped Apollo, and, and and they weren't even hiding it. Yeah, like they were pushing the Copernican Revolution because it was just totally esoteric, you know, Apollo thing. But <laughs> going off of what you're saying, I went to I, my wife and I, we went on a tour of Windsor Castle in England, just outside of London, mm-hmm. and I'm walking around in there, and I'm like. I started noticing that in every single room in Windsor Castle, they have serpents, like, like, you know, like purely like snake serpents. Like you're like, Oh, look, there's, there's serpents there on the door handles. Oh, look, there's serpents up there on the ceiling. Oh, look on that vase over there. There's more. And you start going through it and you start uh-huh. going, yeah, I think, I think these people, I, I don't want to go to any conclusions here, but I think these people are really into <laughs> serpents. You know, you I think? think there's some worshiping of serpents going on, you know, like in your face. Uh, so I kind of just wanted to piggyback off what you were saying there. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it's all in our face today. That's the thing. If you pay any attention at all, it's in the movies, it's in the TV shows, it's in, you know, like South Park and all I mean, it's everywhere. You know, they, these people have come out of the closet. They are telling us exactly who they are, what they represent, what they're trying to do. They put it all out there and, and it's like, well, I told you, you know, we were going to just take over the world and completely screw humanity over in every aspect. 
you know, we we showed you how we were going to do it. And, you know, people yeah. think, oh, well, that, they would never do that. It's, it's it's almost a point of mockery now. It's like you know, like yeah. you see movie posters, and it's like how many movie posters do I have to see where it's like the one eye, you know, like the character with the one eye again. You know, it's just it's right. like it's just purely mockery in your face all the time. You know, like we don't even care anymore. We're just gonna show you what we're doing, and you know, you're just gonna be you know little sheep and good right, little sheep and blah blah blah. Too stupid to figure it out. You know, just too dumb to to catch on to what's happening, and you know, and then that's a sad thing, and that. This always brings me back to that uh, silent weapon, silent weapons for quiet wars document. So I, I always highly recommend to people go find that on the internet. Silent weapons for quiet wars, and just look it up and read it. It's basically a blueprint of what they're doing to us and how they're going to do it. And they actually use uh, electronic uh, symbols and uh, formulas showing how they do all these various things. And these are all psychological operations. And that's an entire industry now in, in, uh, in politics and in advertising. It's psychological manipulation. It's become a highly evolved uh, you know, form of information and in a study. There are many groups. It's, it's a whole vertical market where you know if you want to be uh, the next senator, the next congressman, whatever, you know, you you hire these people who will psychologically manipulate the voters into voting for you. It's a huge industry now. Yeah. And that's the game that we're in. It's all it's a psychological operation, one after another. These false flag movements we see, it's everywhere. It's it's on these uh Propaganda channels like CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CB, you know, the, all the standard, uh, what we think of as mainstream media, which is now overtly propaganda. <laughs> I mean, they, they're just not even trying to hide it. They're not even pretending to be news organizations anymore. They're just like, well, we're just going to tell you a story and we want you to believe it. So just, you know, watch, watch the next story and just take it as, as you know, verbatim. Yeah, um, it's as I, as I was telling you at the commercial break, it's what I call actually one big psychodrama, and that's yeah. a that's a conversation that's a conversation for a whole show, uh, but that's something I put a lot of work into, and uh, I actually did this uh, this essay that I turned into a video on Walt Disney World because I people are always asking like, well, how do you uh, you know how do you uh, how can you practically show what a psychodrama looks like? So I actually just took people on a tour through Walt Disney World, and I showed them basically how Walt Disney World in and of itself is kind of like one big psychodrama. And then I was saying, you know, that's what the world stage is like. And uh, they're just, you know, they're, yeah, it's, they're, they're actually changing our morality through these, these false flag attacks. They're, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's stunning to watch, to watch them just in your face do this stuff. And, you know, the world is one big stage. You probably, you know, get that all the time in your show, but absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, um, anyways, yeah, yeah. All right, we're coming. We got a, about five or six, about five minutes left, I guess. And before we exit the show, Noel, I want you to tell everybody where they can find you if they want to send you an email or if they want to buy one of your books. How can they get in touch with you? I don't want to leave the show without them understanding that. So let's let's get that out there. Well. My uh, my blog where I do um, all of my research is called Our Way is the Highway. Uh, so that would be at WordPress, our way is the ha uh, highway dot WordPress. Uh, is it that? I think it's dot com, com after that. Yep. yep. And yep. And um, my books, uh, my two current ones now, Worthless Mysteries, uh, which is like just a huge like a history of of deception using uh, using scripture uh, and that is sold on Amazon.com as well as the Unexpected Cosmology. The Unexpected Cosmology is is actually part one of a part two biography on Flat Earth. The second one, and I have Robbie Davidson's uh, blessing on this, it's actually going to be a biography on the Flat Earth International Conference, Conferences. So it's going to be called Flat Earth International Conference, and that's going to come out next summer. So I'm I'm going to be interviewing all the speakers from all three uh, all three years. Um, and so those are going to be sold on those are sold on Amazon as well as Sacred Word Publishing, which is Zen Garcia's uh, bookstore. And so he's promoting my book as well, which I'm really thrilled with. 
So those are the places they can find it. If people want to email me, it's just my name at yahoo.com. So, uh, you know, Noel Hadley at yahoo.com. And uh, I love to get in touch with people. You know, they can befriend me on Facebook. I love, I love to just, you know, come say hi and uh, follow my work. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting uh, journey that we're all on, don't you think, Noel? It is, and we don't know. <laughs> as we were talking, we have all these things to say during the commercial break. We don't. I mean, we just don't know what's going to happen. You know, it's it's. You know, this week could be a big week, or next month we just don't know, and it's just always changing. And uh, it's. But this, the thing is with this is that it it's this is a, like a self discovery, and if. If if we're not if if we're just in this and just you know pointing fingers at you know you know reptilian queens and stuff like that, but we're not you know we're, I I almost feel like we're, it's pointless if we're not growing ourselves you know it's, the whole point of getting out yep. of the matrix is to is to no longer be enslaved right and so uh, the journey is this is a this is a pilgrimage for each of us and uh, a journey of self discovery and um, and hopefully getting to know our creator. That's, that's what I would hope for anybody in this. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I, I agree. And uh, I always say all the time, people who listen to the show will, will know that I say, be the captain of your own ship. Don't be following somebody else's program. Use the, the incredible mind and the incredible intellect that God gave you and find the information for yourself. So anyway, it's been a great show, Noel. Thank you so much for being on with us. You've been listening to Inside the Matrix. We'll see you all next week. Take care. This is Inside the Matrix, hosted by Jimmy Brent. Who are we talking about? Jimmy Brent. Jimmy Brent. Jimmy Brent. Live every Sunday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. It is worldwide. Broadcasting from an undisclosed location deep within the neon capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. For more information on the host and the show, please visit InsideTheMatrix.org. That's InsideTheMatrix.org. It's time to break the chains of manipulated consciousness and claim our true nature as creative divine beings. Inside the Matrix. Inside the Matrix. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist. This is the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Now for the news.